Please remain standing and take your hymnals and turn to number 549, 549, Higher Ground. Sing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table long. Continuing with part 13 today, looking at part 2 of the gift of giving, a very important gift and uh, one that each one of us needs to understand is a gift that has been given to us. You have the gift of giving. It's one of the every believer gifts and it's one that some people exercise properly, one that some people exercise poorly, and one that some people do not exercise at all. The spiritual gift of giving. One of the service gifts, we have looked at 10 service gifts so far, covered also the temporary gifts, which were the sign gifts, but uh, we continue today with our study of the gift of giving. Let me recall the definition that we gave to you, the gift of giving enables every believer to provide money and genuine need-based material goods to needy believers. And God has outlined in the New Testament the method in which we are to do that. We are to do it cheerfully, generously, freely, and in simplicity. Four different words that are used to describe the gift of giving in the New Testament. It's to be used in three different ways. Number one, to support the corporate ministry and outreach of the local church where the believer is a functioning part. Number two, to support the pastor or evangelist of the church, and number three, to support sister churches undergoing persecution 
and or severe knee. And we've studied for the last two times that um, the majority of Christians today equate giving with tithing. That is not the gift of New Testament giving. First of all, giving is not the same as tithing because tithing was a mandatory percentage under the law that averaged 20% over a three-year period. Second, we saw that giving is not the same thing as the law of the offerings under the law. The law of the offerings dealt with specific legal penalties imposed for specific sins and specific taxes on specific events and transactions like the birth of a child coming in contact with a dead body or cleansing from leprosy. Third, we saw that the offerings in the Old Testament were in addition to the tithe under the law. Fourth, we saw that a large body of Mosaic law was dedicated to periodic offerings that we are no longer under today related to the tabernacle, the temple, the Sabbath days, the new moons, and the seven feasts of the Lord. We no longer celebrate those things. Fifth, there were also free will offerings, and those were the things that the gift of giving most closely parallels because they were voluntary. They were not required as a specific offering for a specific sin or uh, a tax. They were given by Jews who loved the Lord and who were thankful for all that God has done. And we noted that those are mentioned six times in the Old Testament. New Testament giving is not the same as tithing, nor is it the same as the law of the offerings. New Testament giving is based on love, not on law. And New Testament Christians should certainly not give less than was required under the law if they really love the Lord Jesus Christ. At that point, we move to the New Testament, what it states about the spiritual gift of giving, and saw, first of all, that God requires specific motives in our giving. Romans 12.8, He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. There is a motive stated in that, because simplicity is the word which means double folds of the cloth. That is, no ulterior motives hidden in the folds of the cloak, whereby we have another reason besides love for giving. We also saw that Ananias and Sapphira failed that test and it cost them their lives. There were three specific areas where they failed in New Testament test of giving. One, pretending to give what they had not given. They would have had to have given 100% to match their claim. God called that lying to the Holy Ghost. Number two, having a hidden agenda or ulterior motive in their giving, which was to get the praise of men and double the praise by having them come into the church at different times while the service was going on. Apparently a very long service because Ananias came in first and when he dropped dead, the young men took him, wound him up, took him out and buried him and were almost back to the church by the time Sapphira came in and uh, she said the same thing that her husband had said and uh, Peter told her, he said, well, the feet of those guys who just buried your husband are at the door and they're going to bury you too. So it was a long service and uh, two funerals in the same service plus everything else that was going on at that time. We also saw that we must not try to get glory for ourselves through our giving. God deserves the glory, not man. We also saw not only motives dealt with in the New Testament gift of giving, but we saw that God requires a specific attitude in our giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That's the attitude that we should have when we give, when we come before the Lord. And it's the word in Greek from which we get our word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. That's a man whose money does not control him. Now, it's adding a little to that this week that we didn't mention last week, but I think that is rather interesting because under the Old Testament law, nothing is said either about attitude or motives in relation to tithes and offerings. The reason should be obvious is because those things were legal obligations. That would be similar to our income tax today. When April 15th rolls around, the IRS doesn't care about your motives, paying the minimum actually required by the law. What they care about is, are you paying it all? 
They don't care your motive. They just require you to pay it all. They also don't care about our attitude. You know, you hate paying taxes. You hate all the paperwork. You hate all the energy that goes into it. They don't care about your attitude either. No, the IRS merely requires that you pay in full or you face various penalties. That's the way the law works. That's the way the tithe under the Old Testament worked. That's the way the laws of the offerings worked. It was a legally required mandate. And, you know, it wasn't a matter of whether you liked it or not. It wasn't your attitude. It wasn't your motive in doing it. It was because it was required. Now, we see the New Testament giving illustrated by the church at Macedonia as they gave to the church at Jerusalem. We read the passage last week. We'll not read it again, but I'll summarize the seven specific ways in which the church at Macedonia gave to help the mother church at Jerusalem. Number one, they gave during a great time of persecution. Most of us tend to withdraw during times of trouble. Number two, they gave with overabounding joy. Not just joy, but with overabounding joy. It's amazing that a church going through trouble would be excited about giving to another church. Third, it says they gave during a time of deep poverty. Now, you know, if you've got a lot of extra cash in the bank, you don't mind every now and then doling out a little bit for some need that you perceive. But it says they gave out of their deep poverty. The fourth thing it says about them in that 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, it says they gave extravagantly and generously. I mean, it wasn't pinching pennies. It was extravagant giving. Number five, they gave more than could be reasonably expected so that it meant that they ended up with some needs as well. And I think this is one of the key things that Paul states here in this passage because it means that these people in Macedonia had learned to trust the Lord rather than trusting their riches to meet their needs. Let me say that again. The Macedonian Christians had learned to trust the Lord to meet their needs rather than trusting their bank accounts to meet their needs. Number six, how could they do this? Number six, because they first gave themselves to the Lord. They understood their position as a servant and a steward. They understood that nothing that they owned belonged to them. They were merely entrusted with managing funds that belonged to God. That's a very important principle. And until we learn that principle, how to manage what God has entrusted to us, we will never give like the Macedonians gave. And number seven, very interesting, it says they not only gave themselves first to the Lord, but they gave themselves to help their mentor. The Apostle Paul says, they also gave unto us by the will of God. So the key to that passage, and we have said this before, but I want to emphasize it again, don't look for ways to reduce your giving, Look for ways to increase your giving. Now we've seen that in the Old Testament, the priests and the Levites not only received the best portion of certain offerings that were brought for sacrifices, but they received other things as well. And we answered some questions. Why do we take our offerings on Sunday? Well, it's because Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath, prosper as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. There are five things that are stated in verses 1 through 3. Five elements related to corporate giving. We're not yet talking about individual giving to individual projects. We're talking about the corporate giving in the church. He says, I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Five things he states in verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians 16. Number one, it's to be on the first day of the week. Number two, it is to be pre-planned, systematic giving through the church. Number three, it applies to every believer. Number four, it is not based on the tithe principle, but on how God has prospered. Number five, it's not supplemented by corporate midweek offerings. There were no surprise corporate offerings that were being taken 
There are other principles that relate to needy Christians, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. Then we began looking at the question, which is where we continue today, why do we pay our pastor? Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto, that word communicate means to share with, him that teacheth in all good things. And we noted last week that this immediately precedes what all of us know as the law of the harvest. Be not deceived, very next verse, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season if we faint, we, sh we shall reap if we faint not. Paul gives illustration over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, a very extended passage, as to why those who are serving in pastoral ministry should be paid. And he makes it very clear with multiple illustrations, with multiple illustrations from warfare, multiple illustrations from uh, agriculture, uh, he yields give a vineyard, and a fruit, and then multiple illustrations from uh, animal husbandry. He says, who feeds a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock. And then he points out that the Old Testament actually supports this principle. There are some things under the law that do not relate to us, but Paul says this is a principle that relates to spiritual teaching of those who are being taught. And he says, say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same thing also. And so he's going to refer specifically uh, to the Old Testament law and use it to support a New Testament command. And we know he's talking about the law of Moses because he says so in verse 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox, mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And he asks a question. Doth God take care for oxen? Well, yes, obviously. But that's not the only reason that God wrote that. And Paul explains in the next verse. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? In other words, spiritual service is exceedingly more valuable than temporal service, and it should be paid, certainly, commensurate with temporal service. If others be partaker of this power over you, and there's exousia, it's not dunamis, this, this authority over you, are not we rather? In other words, Paul says, you know, if you look back at who ministered there at Corinth and how many of you trusted Christ through my ministry, almost the whole church there at Corinth should owe something to me, the Apostle Paul. Nevertheless, we have not used this power in other words, Paul says, I didn't push the issue. I didn't uh, insist that because of all that I've done for you, you should therefore pay me. But we suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul wrote to a church that was a carnal church. He wrote to a church that was not spiritual. He makes it very clear at the end of uh, chapter 1, at the beginning of uh, chapter 2, chapter 2 and chapter 3, end of chapter 2, beginning of chapter 3, the difference between those who are spiritual, those who are carnal, and those uh, who are unsaved, the natural man, in those chapters. And as he does so, he points out that the Corinthians, because of all of their wicked activities in their church, were a carnal group of believers. They were people who were not obedient to what God's word commanded them to do. And here's an area where he said, I didn't push my rights here because to push my rights might have hindered the gospel of Christ. Somebody would say, oh, that preacher, he's like those charismatic guys who are always out there collecting offerings and trying to take big, big offerings for themselves. Paul says, I didn't push that. He didn't insist on his right. He wanted people to understand the true value. He taught them the truth about supporting pastors and evangelists, and he did it without being embarrassed and without having to insist on it for himself. Number thir verse 13, do you know, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? 
Uh, the priests didn't have to go out and get part-time jobs to earn a living. Uh, they actually were able to partake of the sacrifices which the worshippers brought to the temple. And of course the priests and Levites not only received the best portion of certain offerings that were brought for sacrifice, but we pointed out last week that they received a special Levitical tithe, 10% each month over 12 months, which is equal to 120% over the course of a year. So under the law, the priests and Levites received a salary of 20% greater than the salary of the average Israelite. Plus, they received the best parts of each of the specific offerings. So Paul continues now in verse 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Paul makes it very clear in verse 14 here that a pastor is supposed to receive a genuine living wage so that he can effectively ch serve the church without having to scrape and struggle with secular or other employment just to survive and meet the needs of his family. And we pointed out, as you know well, all across the United States and around the world, there are many pastors who cheerfully do with less and often work secular jobs because God has called them to preach whether or not a church provides as it should. And it's not optional because Paul says here, even so hath the Lord ordained. So we start here today with, well, why would God give more salary to Levites in the Old Testament? That's a good place to start because you say, well, you know, what about preachers today? Uh, but God gave bigger salary to the Levites for several reasons. Number one, the Levites had no landed inheritance. When Joshua divided the land of Canaan to the children of Israel, the tribe of Levi was given a a, a, no portion of the land at all. The, it was divided. There were 12 divisions of the land, but that was because of the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and that makes up 12 tribes there. And so Levi was not given a big area of land like the other tribes were given. They were given instead only specific cities scattered throughout the tribes with a very small land around each city for raising crops. Number two, the second reason that they received more was the principal Levitical cities were on the borders of the land because the Levites were the standing army of Israel. They were the initial line of defense against the enemy, both spiritual and physical. Uh, this is one of the fascinating things I learned when I was in Israel studying. Uh, one of my projects was to outline all of the uh, ancient borders and where they would be located uh, through verses of scripture and then draw a map and put down the map and then on the map locate all the Levitical cities and the cities of refuge. And um, it was interesting to notice that the Levitical cities were placed around the borders because they were the first line of defense in case an enemy would enter. And God had made a special promise to Israel that if Israel would go up all the men aged 20 and over to the main three feasts in Jerusalem every year, that at that time, God would put the terror of Jehovah into their hearts so that they would not invade when all the Jewish adult males were leaving from all over the land and, and coming up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. God made a special promise of protection and provision. But while those feasts were not going on, the Levites, at other times of the year, would be there in the cities teaching the people, but also armed and ready for war. Very interesting concept as you look at it. In a sense, they're getting paid for doing a double duty job. Number three, the rest of the cities scattered throughout the tribes were so that the Levites would provide a spiritual teaching presence in every tribe and not merely at Jerusalem. Number four, the Levites and priests were also given, and I mentioned it a moment ago, the six cities of refuge. There were three of them on the west side of the Jordan River. There were three of them on the right side of the Jordan River. They were equidistantly spaced apart. And those of you who have studied your Old Testament know that the cities of refuge were designed by God, these six special cities, so that if a man accidentally killed another man, he could flee to a city of refuge, and so they were equidistant from the farthest parts of the country. There was one close enough where he could flee to before the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, 
and recognize that the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, did many different things. He had to redeem those of his relatives who were in bondage, but he also had the responsibility of pursuing someone who had killed a near relative of his. He had the responsibility of redeeming land that had been sold outside the family. He had the responsibility of marrying a widow, as you know from the book of Ruth, uh, who was the widow of a near kinsman. Uh, the Goel had many different responsibilities outlined under Old Testament law. But one of those was to pursue someone who had accidentally killed one of his near relatives. And so the cities of refuge were given to the Levites so that a man could flee there and he would be safe until the judges could hear his case. And the Goel would come and the man who had killed the near relative, the evidence would be presented and if it was indeed an accidental killing, then that man would remain in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. In other words, it was sort of like you're stuck inside the city boundaries. Uh, because if you go outside the city boundaries, the Goel was then free to kill you. But if the high priest died, and that might be for a long time, it might be for a short time, you were stuck inside the city until that time. So they had the responsibility not only of being Levites and priests, but they also had the responsibility of acting as judges. For example, Samuel was not only a priest, but he's also listed as a judge of Israel. So last week I gave you the teaser. I said, uh, well, we want to talk about what the New Testament says about the percentage that a pastor should be paid. And for most pastors, this is a, an embarrassing subject, but I tell you anyway because it's in the scripture. But the New Testament actually gives a percentage that a pastor should be paid. Um, if we're not under the Old Testament law that required Israel to give priests and Levites 120% plus the best portions of the offering. Well, Paul tells us about the percentage over in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And those of you who see the little white envelopes with the red print on them that says Pastor Salary Fund will note that these are the verses that are listed on those envelopes. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially, and that word especially is a very, very neat word, very important word. It's the word malista. It's a word that we would say, by that I mean to say, or let me focus in on what I'm talking about here. Let them be worthy of double honor, especially, by that I mean to say, so it doesn't apply to all the elders, they who labor in the word and doctrine. Verse 18, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Now that's the same verse that Paul quoted in 1 Corinthians 9.9, 9, which we read just a few moments ago, and is a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. And then he goes on and he says, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. That's not quoted from the Old Testament. That's quoted from Jesus. So he takes an Old Testament quotation from Deuteronomy and he gives us a quotation that Jesus made that's recorded twice in the Gospels. It's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 10, verse 7, and in Matthew, chapter 10, verse 10. So both the law of Moses and the Lord Jesus Christ taught these principles. Old Testament, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. New Testament, words of Jesus, the laborer is worthy of his reward. Obviously talking about paying a laborer. It's interesting to note also, and I'll just throw this in for free on the side, how this bears on the doctrine of inspiration. Because here, Luke is being quoted in the same context and as equal authority with Moses. Now the word double honor here, you say, well, okay, we'll give you twice as much honor, all right? The word double honor literally means double pay. The word honor is the Greek word time, and it literally means, quote, value or money paid. Now we normally think of honor only in terms of esteem, but that's not the way the word is used here. It is sometimes used that way, but only by analogy. The literal meaning is value or money paid. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double pay. By that I mean to say, they who labor in the word and doctrine. 
Now, I know that makes some people feel uncomfortable. Folks, it's not because I'm looking to get double pay. Though, from God's perspective, that is what he says. But it's so that you will know what the scripture says. Every one of us needs to understand what God requires of each one of us. In simple terms, if you took an average salary by adding up all the income of the congregation and divided it by the number of people in the congregation, the proper salary for the pastor is twice that amount. If the average salary in the congregation is $15,000, then the pastor should be paid $30,000. If the average salary is $25,000, then the pastor should be paid $50,000, and so on. In percentage terms, that means 200% of the average income. Now, if that seems shocking to you, and I'm sure it does, uh, I don't know if anybody has ever preached that here before, uh, that's certainly something that you learn in seminary, but very few guys are, are willing to preach that because they're afraid they'll get fired. So fire me. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not worried about that. I'm trying to teach you the truth, folks. And when you obey the truth, you discover God's blessing. Both truth in terms of the giving to and through the church in terms of paying the salary, and in terms of the many other opportunities that the New Testament says we have for giving outside the corporate giving, where we're individually giving to individuals and other things like missions. We need to understand we are stewards. Our money is not ours. We are stewards. It all belongs to God. He provides enough so that we can live, and he certainly has enabled all of us to live comfortably. But his perspective is the eternal perspective, which should be our perspective, where we realize that there are things in heaven, heavenly rewards, that are worth even the smallest of them, far more than everything we could ever gather here on earth. Oh, to gain God's perspective on things. But anyway, if you feel shocked, feel free to look up the word time in your Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It's number 592 in the Greek dictionary at the back of the concordance. I think many of you have a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. If not, I'll be happy to show you mine. Uh, I use it frequently because I want to know what words mean. And so you can look it up. That's in the back. There's a Hebrew concordance, uh, a Hebrew dictionary, and there's a, a Greek dictionary. The Hebrew dictionary, all the letters and numbers are straight. In the Greek dictionary, which is toward the end, after the Hebrew dictionary, the letters are, or the numbers are all tilted like this. They're italics. So you can tell whether or not you're in the Hebrew or Greek concordance, even if you don't know what those funny-looking words there are. But then it explains it in English. This is number 592 in the Greek dictionary. If a concordance study doesn't satisfy you, I encourage you to look up 1 Timothy 5.17 in, in the biblical commentary on 1 Timothy. This issue is not a matter of my personal opinion. It's a command of scripture. The reason that most pastors who are underpaid are willing to suffer the deprivation is because God has called them to the pastoral ministry and God always meets their needs even if the congregation does not. But then the congregation loses the blessing of God while the pastor is blessed for walking by faith. And I have seen that for many years. Almost 40 years in the ministry now. And we have never failed to have a meal, never failed to have clothing, never failed to have the various needs met, even at times when the churches I was serving could not pay me at all, and I had to go out and get a secular job. You know what? God always met our needs. And I think that this is true for every pastor who looks back over ministry and sees times when God supernaturally in ways that are inexplicable, and not merely in one way, but in multiple different ways, met their needs. But when we fail to obey God, in whatever sphere it might be, we lose the blessing that comes to us from those moments when we do obey God, the sporadic moments in between all the other things. When we do obey God, we discover that he suddenly has immense blessings for us.
And I'm not telling you this to put you on a guilt trip about my salary. I'm telling you this because it's revealed in Scripture as the will of God. I'm called to preach the whole counsel of God, and this is part of the gift of giving. This is the same reason that Paul gave to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9.15, which immediately follows the extended passage that we read a few moments ago in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 14. This is the verse that immediately follows verse 14. So hear these two verses together. 1 Corinthians 9, 14 and 15. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Paul points out that they failed. But he says, I'm not doing this to try to strong arm you into giving me more money. In fact, he says, I would rather die than lose the heavenly rewards that God will give me for having walked by faith. But Corinthians, he says, you are losing a blessing by not doing what God has called you to do with all the material resources that you have collected and hoarded up and for which someday you will die and leave them, perhaps even to people who are not even saved. Oh, that we would understand the use of God's resources. Now let's talk briefly about some of the other areas of personal giving that are in addition to, not in place of, but in addition to corporate giving. There are too many passages to look at all of them in depth, but let me just mention a few of the additional giving opportunities that the New Testament offers to you. And there are many different areas. For example, giving to missions above and beyond the corporate giving of the church, not in place of, but in addition to. Number two, giving to needy brothers or sisters, instead of just saying, as James points out, be warmed and filled. Now what does it profit? If you don't provide the things that are needful for the body, if you only say be warmed and filled, what doth it profit, my brethren? Number three, providing for aged or widowed parents. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear that the man who does not do this is worse than an infidel. Number four, providing for widows in the church. And Paul has a, an extended list of qualifications as to which widows should be provided for by the church. But, uh, you know, it can take many different forms. For example, my brother, uh, a number of years ago, was pastoring a church in San Antonio. And some of the people caught sight of this vision. I'll give you one illustration. There was a mechanic in the church who worked for the San Antonio Public School District, repairing the buses for the school district. And this man, after he got saved, he was saved under my brother's ministry, he was so excited about what Christ had done for him, he wanted to be do able to do something, but he didn't have much money. So what he did was once a month, he would come over to the church with all of his tools and with his truck that had his tools in it, and any widow or needy person in the church who had car troubles, he would repair their car for free and would provide the parts. That's meeting the needs of other believers in the church in a practical way whereby God had given him some special skills. What a, a testimony that was and how filled with joy those widows were because they couldn't pay. What a ministry and what an outreach that gave them because all the community began to realize as the widows would talk about the blessing that God had given them through this humble man there in that church. What abilities has God given you by which you could minister to the body of Christ? What skills do you have? The key, the gift of giving does not require you to give anything to sinning brothers. We're talking about ministering to genuine needs within the body of Christ, but you don't have to give anything to sinning brothers who won't work to earn a living. There are always bums in the church, even during the time of the Apostle Paul. Lazy bums will always have an excuse as to why they cannot work. They never want to admit that they're wrong or lazy. 
It's always somebody else's fault. Proverbs 26.16 tells us about them. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Now hear what Paul says about not giving to lazy brothers. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. Now that word disorderly, you can look that one up too. That's the word lazily. Withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh lazily, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly or lazily. We didn't act lazy among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. You remember Paul was a tent maker. And there were a number of churches that never did support him. Not because we have not power. Again, this is exousia, not dunamis. It's the word for authority. Not because we have not authority. But to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Paul says, I gave you the example of diligent, hard work. Now, you don't support the lazy brothers who refuse to work. I did this so that you would understand the principle of diligent, hard work. This past week, I read a, a very interesting uh, article. came from Rutgers University, the Rutgers uh, magazine. And uh, it was about a, a professor who has earned the National uh, Medal of Science. And um, one of the things in the article was, um, well, so what do you attribute your success to? He says, well, I work hard. And then I work some more. And after I'm all done with that, I really work hard. <laughs> you know, the man understood the principle. And he's gotten to the top as a result. And he said, I've taught my children to do the same thing. And three of them are doctors and one of them's a lawyer. Dear people, hard work. We don't like the thought of it. Here in America, everything has got to become easier and easier and easier for us. But Paul was teaching the church a principle. A man who refuses to work should not be supported by the local church. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you. This is not a suggestion. This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. You know, hunger will eventually get to a man. And he will go out and find a job. Or else he'll try to go out and be a thief and get caught and get thrown in jail so that he's being fed by taxpayers' dollars, but in an unpleasant circumstance. If any will not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, that's the word lazily, working not at all, but are busybodies. They're the kind of people that you can never get off the phone. They're the kind of people that always want to know all the dirt about everybody else. You see, if they were busy working, they wouldn't have time for that kind of stuff. Those are people that will cause trouble in the church and cause division in the church. Now we command them that are such and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. When there is an official breaking of fellowship with those who are lazy bums, even if they're Christians, the purpose is to bring them to shame, cause them to be ashamed, and not to keep relying on their crummy excuses as to why they couldn't possibly get a job. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. We're talking about real believers. There are real Christians who are lazy and who do not work. Paul says, if any will not work, neither shall he eat. Shame is a powerful motivating factor that should be used against the sluggard who, according to Proverbs, is almost beyond repentance. Well, we could say a lot more about giving, but that's enough for now. It's 20 minutes past, so we're not going to continue giving next week. We'll start, the Lord willing, with ministration. But if you want other references, see 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through chapter 9, verse 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. 
We've already talked about 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 16. And remember, as you look at those passages, the word communicate is the word for sharing. Lord willing, we'll talk about ministration, exhortation, mercy, and hospitality next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word. Father, we've heard some hard things today. We've said some hard things today. Difficult for me as well as difficult for your people here. And yet, Father, it's your word. And your word never returns void, but it accomplishes that which you please, and it prospers in the thing whereto you've sent it. Father, we thank you that you are the God who gives. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. O oh, Father, how we thank you that of your own will you begat us. And Father, that is a great gift, the gift of life, eternal life. And you've promised that if you've already given us eternal life, how shall you not with him, our Lord Jesus Christ, freely give us all things? We pray, Father, that you will keep us from being miserly with you. Everything we have has come from your hand. And we confess it as such. And in our hearts now, Father, we bow before you and admit that we are not only your servants, but we are stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. A steward manages his master's resources in the way that the master commands. And so, Father, we pray that you will help us to manage the resources that you have put into our hands so that as we do so, someday when we stand before our Lord Jesus Christ, we will hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Thank you again, Father, for your word. Bless it to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.